All right, I'm moving right to our next presentation, which will be a double whammy, if I may say so, <laughs> by two of our developers. Tomasz Maczkowak and Radosław Jankiewicz will be talking about uh, machine learning. I was asking th them how to introduce them on the stage. They said pretty much you should say that we are dinosaurs at STX Next. How are you dinosaurs, I asked. Well, we remember the times when our CEO used to code. <laughs> they still remember those times. Uh, I Do you remember the times when he was teaching us to code? <laughs> Do you remember the times when he was teaching us to code? You to code? Okay, some people are not nodding, so I, I believe some people were around then as uh, well. Our two machine learning twins have also published on our blog a simple uh, well, I shouldn't say simple, uh, actually a quite comprehensive yeah. tutorial on machine learning in Python. As always, you know, I work in marketing, I'm responsible for the blog, please visit. It would be great if you could read that article. And they will be talking about computers playing computer games. There's actually a gamepad on the stage, which makes me extremely excited. So I won't waste any more of uh, your time. Are we all ready? Yep. Okay, great. So get it up for... Tomasz Maczkowiak, Radosław Jankiewicz. So, good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Radek Jankiewicz. And I'm Tomasz Maczkowiak. And as Kuba just said, our presentation will be about using machine learning for teaching a computer to play a computer game. Uh, let's start with, with traditionally a short anecdote about the authors. So, on this picture you can, you can uh, find both me and uh, Tomek during a uh, STX Next hackathon event. Uh, and this picture was taken uh, almost 10 years ago. <laughs> so More uh, than 10 years ago. More, it more it than 10 years ago, right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we are enjoying uh, programming in Python in STX Next for over a decade yet. Yeah, and uh, if you can, if you are smart, you will figure <laughs> out who this guy is also. Yeah, that's, that's Wojtek, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The good old time. Uh, so uh, let's get back to our presentation and let's start with defining what the machine learning term stands for. So simply speaking, uh, we can say that machine learning is, is a field of computer science that gives computers uh, ability to learn without being explicitly programmed, uh, which means that uh, the machine learning algorithm uh, can, can adjust and uh, can uh, improve the accuracy of uh, its results uh, based on the training data that is provided. Um, and uh, this technology isn't, isn't an invention of, of recent years. The origins of, of machine learning uh, are dated in the 50s of the previous century, uh, which means it's almost seven, 70 years old. Uh, however, uh, you can notice a significant rise of popularity uh, in recent years. Uh, and uh, as you can see, Python uh, is statically, statistically uh, the, um, the most popular language used for, for machine learning by, by scientists and by machine learning community. And uh, that may be because uh, there are um, a lot of major frameworks and libraries, uh, like those mentioned here, uh, TensorFlow by Google, uh, like Scikit-Learn, PyTorch, or Keras. Uh, there are also uh, some libraries for uh, processing big data, uh, big big data sets like Pandas, uh, or uh, a tools for visualizi visualizing uh, data like uh, Matplotlib. Uh, so uh, Python has a, a really vast ecosystem for machine learning. Vast and mature. Right. Um, and uh, speaking about uh, use cases of machine learning, uh, the list is very long and, and it's still growing, still increasing. Uh, and you can you can you can find you can find that machine learning has application in many fields uh, like uh, financials, financials, uh, health healthcare, uh, and and many other interesting stuff, uh, but we found uh, even a, a bit more, um, well, uh, a bit more interesting uh, uh, area where, where it is used. Uh, and and uh, it's uh, autonomous vehicles, right? So we can uh, learn a, a 
a vehicle to drive itself. Uh, and this, this idea, um, well, we, f we feel very excited, ex we felt very excited about this idea. So uh, we try out to uh, come up with uh, our uh, implementation, of course, a very, uh, very simplified uh, version of it. Uh, so uh, we attempted to prepare a game uh, which objective is to drive a vehicle in a tunnel uh, in the shortest time, which means uh, you have to avoid the obstacles on your way. Uh, the map is, of course, randomly generated, so, so uh, you, you, have to, you have to really uh, know how to fly to, to accomplish uh, the level. Uh, and uh, we attempted to make it possible for, uh, for, a, for a human player to teach uh, an algorithm uh, to play this game. Uh, so we equipped uh, the vehicle uh, with a number of sensors uh, that are measuring the distance between uh, between the vehicle and the obstacle or ground. Um, and well, the uh, rule of how it works is really simple and can be compared to uh, to a car parking uh, sensor system in your car. Uh, so we are collecting the flight parameters, uh, and as you can see, we 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 are collecting and storing the uh, data from the sensors as a, as, a, as a vector of integer numbers, which which. Uh, which says uh, how far are we uh, uh, from the from the obstacle? A single sensor is like this one line of dots. So uh, this this one line is one number in this array. This six here means that uh, the seventh sensor from the vehicle is the one that detected uh, the particular obstacle. Uh, apart of that, we are collecting uh, the uh, horizontal and vertical. Uh, velocity of, of 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 the vehicle and uh, some uh, some uh, metadata like um, the distance from from the, the beginning of of the level and a current timestamp and a part of that uh, we are also uh, collecting um, and storing uh, the information about uh, human player uh, controls being used in a given part of time this is uh, for learning we are we are we are storing this data and then we are applying it for our uh, algorithm uh, to teach it uh, how to how to control the vehicle. Yes, and the controls they mean up, left, and right because the vehicle can you have an, uh, uh, you have a vertical acceleration. You can tell it to go up, and you also have acceleration on the left and right. And the vehicle it actually has not only speed but also acceleration. So if you keep the button pressed longer, you are uh, accelerating faster and faster. Uh, so we uh, tried to approach uh, this problem um, with with uh, supervised learning, uh, which works. Uh, speaking simply, it works this way that we are providing the inputs, which are the uh, data, which is the data of, of uh, flight parameters, and the labels, uh, which is uh, the data about the data of uh, the user controls being uh, being. Um, Used in given uh, moment, and we are uh, providing this 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 data to the model. Uh, we are providing this data to the algorithm, which is training our model. And uh, in the next step, uh, we are able to use our model uh, and predict what should be what keys should be uh, should be pressed in a given situation when when for a given uh, set of uh, flight parameters. And uh, we 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 did it uh, in this approach. Uh, so, so we cho we, cho we, cho we chosen uh, the supervised uh, uh, learning approach. Yes. Yeah, so basically, the vehicle, the uh, artificial intelligence is learning from the human driver. So this is exactly the same process that Google used when they were developing their self-driving car. Uh, they were just the driving the car through the deserts and other terrains uh, with real drivers and recording what the drivers were doing. And this is how they were developing their own self-driving car. Uh, the question that some of you might ask at this point already is why you wouldn't use reinforced learning, which is very commonly used for solving uh, for solving games. Now, those uh, quite famous algorithms that are playing the old Atari games, learning uh, by using reinforced learning. Uh, the thing is that. Uh, we had another use for this in mind. Uh, we were organizing an event uh, 
for teaching uh, or introduction to machine learning. And this game was a tool to achieve that. And uh, also reinforced learning is just harder to do. Uh, you can do it, but you need additional things. For example, you need the whole interpreter, and the reward function and other stuff uh, added on top of the game. And we wanted something really simple that would integrate really well uh, and would be very easy to use for the developers that will try to solve the game using the artificial intelligence. So that's why we didn't use uh, uh, reinforced learning, even though that is uh, the commonly used uh, technique for such tasks. Uh, so, uh, as Radek was saying, we are, the game is sending uh, this uh, set of uh, values to the backend that later on can use it for machine learning. And uh, now I will try to describe to you how did we, uh, what was our solution for machine learning. So we took the values coming in and we trans transformed them into features that we were feeding to the algorithm. Uh, we had the velocities, those translate directly into features, no, uh, no surprise here. Uh, but then we had an array of sensors that we transformed each into one feature. So uh, the first sensor becomes one of the features, the next sensor is another feature. Uh, the problem is that if our sensors don't detect any obstacle, because the obstacle is just too far, like if your car is too far from any kind of obstacle, it also doesn't detect anything. So in that case, the game is sending null, null value. Uh, so there we had the transformation that we were putting here a number one greater than the maximum sensor value. The maximum sensor value was 15 because there were 15 dots on those sensors. So we were just putting 16 as the next value. Uh, so that's how we constructed an array of features. That was the input for the algorithm. And the controls that the player was uh, using, we transformed into an array of labels. So basically we just took them, transformed them into floating point values, and uh, those were the expected labels. Uh, so we implemented a simple uh, neural network uh, with one hidden layer of uh, just 20 nodes. And we were teaching, uh, and we were teaching this network to uh, to fly through the maze. And it turned out that this architecture is more than enough to solve this uh, problem in a quite satisfactory uh, manner. Uh, it worked. Uh, it worked pretty well. Uh, but uh, the game has one hard point, and those are the blind alleys. And the blind alleys are very hard to solve in this kind of way because when you get into this point, uh, you need to actually fly back and then get out of it. So this is, this is the hard part, this is the hard, uh, hardest part of the game. Uh, and to solve this, you probably need to take into account previous state. It means that when you are here, it, that you also need to consider that you entered here and you stayed here, for example, for already half a second. So that's a sign that you need to fly back and try again, like this guy does here. So uh, this introduced this, uh, we introduced this concept of temporal dependency that uh, the decision that the algorithm needs to take at a given point in time doesn't depend only on this point in time, but also on previous points. Uh, the game is running at 60 frames per second. Uh, so it collects about 60 frames of data in each second. And we figured out that we will be taking one second of data into account. So basically what we did is we concatenated all the features from all the 60 frames. So all the features from the last second. That is a very simplistic approach. It means that uh, the number of features grows from 13 to 60 times that. But that is still not a great number for machine learning algorithms. If you have any kind of machine learning that uh, deals with text processing, you usually have tens of thousands of features. So this is not that, this is not such a big number. Uh, and the labels, expected labels, well, we are still taking only the ones from the most recent frame. So you, the decision in, the decision you take is the one that was taken at the last frame. So the current one or the, the most recent one. And uh, we also created a, a neural network for this task, 
only now it was a little bit more complex. We added one more hidden layer, so two hidden layers, one with 512 nodes and another one with uh, 64 nodes. Uh, and we were just, uh, the number of features was just greater. Instead of those 13 features, here we had those 13 times 60 features. And uh, this neural network, uh, this neural network uh, worked pretty well. Uh, before we started the presentation, you had the game running there. That was that was that exact architecture playing the game, and as you could see, it was flying through the maze, no problem. So this worked pretty well. Uh, if uh, you are familiar with machine learning, then you might ask how you might ask us uh, why we didn't use uh, recurrent neural networks, which are the common. Uh, tool for solving uh, problems that have some time dependency. Well, we just didn't get around to it. That was next on our list of uh, things to do, but it turned out that the previous architecture with just concatenating the features was enough. The model was not too complex and it just worked. So uh, we just didn't have to uh, resolve to this more complex, uh, more complex solution. Uh, so, uh, this is the this is uh, a little recording of uh, the game being played by the, by the algorithm. This is exactly the same stuff as you watched before we started the presentation. Uh, and as I mentioned, we uh, organize an event for teaching machine learning. We organize a hackathon in Poznan, where we had seven teams competing. Uh, they were given the game, and they had to implement the machine learning on their own. Uh, for solving the game. And then, uh, because the game was developed by us, we allowed there to be multiple players playing simultaneously against each other. So we had seven teams uh, playing th on the same level at the same time against each other. It was very fun, very, edu uh, very educational. All teams managed to create some agent that was playing the game. Uh, one team, uh, one team, of course, won. But we, we were having, uh, we were playing multiple rounds. There were uh, at least two other teams that were competing for uh, for the winning title. So it was pretty pretty fascinating to watch the little little guys fly through the maze. Sometimes they would get stuck, and another guy would uh, overtake them, and so on and so on. It was uh, it was really fun to watch. And uh, another thing that we took out of this, out of this was that uh, different teams had different approaches to the problem. Uh, the solution that I described to you uh, before, that was my solution, but uh, other teams had other, uh, other proposals, how to solve the temporal dependency. The simplest one being just taking into account uh, the growth of the distance from the beginning of the level in the last uh, X seconds. So that was another another uh, another uh, solution to this, and that was the winning solution, by the way. Uh, so congrats to the team that won, uh, Janusza ML. Uh, so conclusions from uh, from this uh, supervised learning attempt. Uh, it works. Uh, you can uh, teach the algorithm to fly uh, this aircraft, and it's pretty basic. Uh, I mean, there's is just not that hard. Uh, all the teams managed to do it within six hours, and they didn't get the game before. So, with after getting the game within six hours, we uh, we had seven different implementations of machine learning for flying this uh, vehicle. So it was pretty it was pretty nice and easy because Python has very good and mature support for machine learning and. Uh, great uh, documentation and other resources so you can get into this really, really fast. And uh, another very important thing is that the quality of data has very big influence on the results. Uh, I was training my algorithm, Radek was training his algorithm, and uh, afterwards we exchanged data between ourselves. We, I got the dump from Radek and I had my dump of my data. And because Radek was many years driving an Audi, he's just a better driver. And it turned out that it counts. The, all those years of driving an Audi made him a better driver and his algorithm was beating mine uh, each and every time. Because he, the quality of his data was just better. He was crashing less, he was driving faster. So uh, that's- Although my algorithm wasn't accurate as yours, it was like uh, with, uh, with a lower 
uh, lower accuracy of, of uh, predictions. Uh, my, uh, with, with my data, I was in, m in many times, I, I, my, my vehicle was flying better than, than Tomek. Yeah, so uh, the quality of data uh, counts very much. We learned that by example, and this is true for all machine learning problems. If you put, if you have the actual principle is called garbage in, garbage out. If you put garbage into your algorithm, you get garbage on the outside. So if you don't have good data, there's no point in doing machine learning because you're not gonna do, you're not gonna learn anything. And uh, if you have a thing like we do, where the s previous state counts, you should take into account because it improves the uh, it improves the learning very much. The simple algorithm that was not taking a, into account the previous state, you can teach it to get out of the blind alleys, Rad Radek managed, but it was a very meticulous process where he had to basically fly into the blind alleys and get out of them time after time just to teach the algorithm to do that. Uh, my algorithm, on the other hand, the more complex one that I was showing you, that was taking the 60 frames of reference into account, uh, it was easier to train it because I didn't have to repeat this process of getting into the blind alleys and getting out of them. It was just better at, uh, at learning this particular stuff. But it's possible to, to achieve a good result also without it, it's just harder. So that was pretty easy, right? There was a game, we solved it, other people solved it, six hours, uh, that, that was pretty easy. So we figured out, let's try to get to scale it up a notch. So we asked ourselves, uh, what would happen if we tried to teach it to fly live? Uh, usually when you, are when you are doing machine learning, the first thing you do is you gather data. And after you gathered your data, you are t teaching an algorithm, and then the algorithm is making predictions. But what if you didn't have the data? What if the algorithm is starting without any data and it teaches as you go? So we asked ourselves if this would be even possible. So uh, we wanted to try if, uh, if live learning is possible. Uh, is the, is, could a neural network learn fast enough for this to be even feasible? And uh, is it fast enough to run live? Aren't the computations just too heavy to be executing live as the player is playing. Uh, can it even be done live? Because uh, there are some problems with it uh, that you don't encounter in the classical, uh, in the classical uh, machine learning. For example, when you are doing machine learning, you usually have all your data and you divide it in batches and you feed, all in, you feed those batches into your algorithm, right? But if you are learning live, then you do not have batches, you don't have data, you just have things coming into you live. So uh, we figured out that we can use queues instead of batches. So we have a queue that is accumulating data as the player is, tr is flying and training the algorithm. And uh, once the queue fills up to be big enough, we extract a batch of data from it. And then we empty the front of the queue and we, are, we will be appending the new frames uh, to the end of the queue. So instead of batches, we have queues uh, that are converted into batches as uh, soon as the queue fills up. Uh, Pre-processing, when you have your machine learning, the first step you do before throwing the data to your algorithm is you are doing pre-processing, you are doing scaling, you are doing some transformations. Uh, but you cannot do that if you are doing live learning because you don't have any frame of reference. You don't know what is the maximum, num maximum value for example, for the horizontal velocity. We don't know that when we are starting without any data, right? So we cannot scale the numbers to be between zero and one, for example, it's just not possible. Uh, so what we did is we applied batch normalization on the input. Batch normalization is a, te is a technique used in machine learning in between, uh, usually in between layers in your network uh, to make, to uh, have all of them scale to the same uh, range of values. It's uh, basically collecting data about the uh, population uh, as it passes through the neural network and it's adjusting the scaling as it goes. So we figured out we can put that uh, as a first layer just after the input before it passes to the actual neural network and this will do the pre-processing for us. Another thing is that when you are doing the normal machine learning, the classical way, 
you have your data and you are passing the data through the network few times uh, and one time is called an epoch. So usually you sometimes you pass the data 10 times through uh, all the data is passed. Uh, each example in your data is passed to the network 10 times, for example, if you have 10, if you have 10 epochs, sometimes it's 10,000 times if you have, uh, have uh, 10,000 epochs. But we only have one epoch because we are teaching it to fly live. Uh, we also cannot do data shuffling. We cannot randomize the data because we have them coming in as we go. So there's not much room for randomizing the stuff here. So we are just not doing it. So we came up with this uh, with this term called learning by streaming, where uh, first the we are simultaneously teaching and predicting using the same algorithm. So Radek will be flying the vehicle and his data will be collected and sent to the server, which will append it to the queue. Uh, meantime, the artificial intelligence will be also flying and it will be querying for predictions. It will ask us, I'm in this situation, what, what should I do? We'll add it to the queue and we'll start prediction. The, pr the neural network will predict straight away uh, some some controls and we'll tell the the little guy to go up or left or right. Uh, at first it won't have, it will not be taught, so we'll be just making random choices. Uh, but uh, then next time, uh, next frame, Radex data will be sent to the backend, it will be up into the queue and the queue will fill up and then we'll be able to do the first, uh, the first uh, round of fitting. Uh, so let's see if it works. Yeah, it's time for, for a, a live demo uh, presentation. So keep your I'm scrolls because we are doing live demo. All right, so I'm controlling the yellow uh, vehicle. Uh, and uh, the, the, blue guy, the blue guy is the artificial intelligence. And uh, at this moment, it's starting without any data. So it's just uh, behaving randomly. Right now, it just got stuck. And Radek will try to get into the same position as it is. Uh, Radek is the yellow guy, and we'll try to get to teach it how to get out of this spot. And as you could see, he managed to make it get out, and it didn't take that long. We are only 30 seconds in. All right, I will restart the game just to to, to show you how uh, the algorithm is improving its uh, quality, how the uh, vehicles steered by AI is going better and better with with uh, time. So Radek will now be playing. Well, now he will be playing like if he was playing normally, and every few seconds he will be restarting, uh, restarting the guy in the same position that he's, he is, and you'll see if the guy is really improving. So now we are 20 seconds in, and you can already see that the little guy is somehow able to figure out that he should go right. And uh, the longer Radek flies the more data is uh, streamed and taught to uh, the artificial intelligence. So the longer Radek flies, the better uh, the artificial intelligence should be. Uh, so he's uh, just playing the game, uh, trying to avoid uh, the obstacles. And all of this data from his flight is being collected, uh, collected by the algorithm. And uh, yeah, you can see that uh, it's not doing it's not doing perfectly, but it's, it's doing something there. And the longer he the longer he flies, the better the results should be. Uh, yeah, you can see that now the guy figured out that he should he should avoid the bottom. Yeah, he's doing something there, right? You can but see it's the only improvement. Just one minute of, of learning, right? Yeah, now we are just like one minute in, uh, and. Uh, it's not perfect what he's doing, but it's uh, it's getting better. Remember that at the beginning he was just making random moves because he was just basing his decisions on random noise on in the neural network. And now you can see that he's he's actually managing to uh, to do some stuff uh, to get out of this spot in the blind alley. That would require Radek to also get into the same spot and just show it by example what it should do in this particular situation. So. That's uh, that will require Radek to take special action, but just flying through the maze should be uh, should be actually should be able to teach it to do that without uh, without that uh, much effort. So we are about two minutes uh, two minutes in, and you can see that 
it's still not perfect, but uh, it's doing something. The the other fact is that uh, Radek needs to play really well. If he doesn't play well, then the algorithm is also teaching uh, itself not really well. Uh, please be aware that this is a live demo, and uh, Radek is under some form of stress. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we are we are uh, reaching about three minutes in, uh, and uh, you can see that the guy is not flying perfectly, but it's flying somehow, right? If we if you keep looking at it, it's actually managing somehow to fly through the level. And uh, after three minutes, you can see that uh, those three minutes of flight was enough to teach it to do basic uh, basic run through the maze. So that's that's what we wanted to show that uh, you can teach the you can teach the guy to fly live. And I think I think we somehow managed. <laughs> so let me just let me just uh, quickly go to through some conclusions to this. Uh, Live learning works. Uh, you seen that we were able to teach the algorithm to fly without having any previous data collected. Uh, the solution that we implemented was TensorFlow as the learning tool and uh, asynchronous input output HTTP uh, library and WebSockets uh, on the back end. So we were streaming the data uh, between the browser and TensorFlow, and it turns out that TensorFlow is super fast. Actually, the teaching uh, one batch, which is I think 32 or 64 uh, examples to TensorFlow is always under one millisecond, so it's uh, it's really, really fast. And computers can learn from humans, and they, are, they can do it really, really <laughs> fast. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you have any questions, yeah. if we have time? Uh, we actually ran out of time for questions. You are very welcome to approach Tomek and Radek during the break, but right now, we're going to have this break and meet here again at 15 past three. Thank you.